Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Davies, pro-chancellors, faculty and staff and students of this university for an incredible honor. I have done some studying about Swansea University in the last weeks, and I am so impressed with the way that the leadership and the support of the community has been transforming the university into a world-class hub for academic pursuit, as well as the pursuit of truth, reason, and innovation. Thank you as well to Sir Roger Jones, Sir Roderick Evans, Professor Elwyn Evans for those very kind remarks, Professor Mike Sullivan, and Professor Philip Bobbitt for making this engagement possible. Now, as you have already heard, um, as a child growing up, uh, Wales was a part of my larger understanding because it had a special place in my heart due to my family's connections with it. My great-grandfather was a Welsh coal miner who came to America in search of opportunity and a better life. My grandmother, Hannah Jones Rodham, grew up hearing about the beauty of the Welsh countryside, attending the local Methodist church, and singing traditional Welsh hymns. She passed on not only those stories, but the values of hard work and resilience to my father, Hugh Ellsworth Rodham, who passed them on to me. Later in her life, my late mother became interested in learning more about our family's ties uh, to the old country. And through her correspondence with the West Glamorgan Archive Service, she learned that her great-grandfather, Edwin John Howell, lived in Wales for a number of years, including right here in Swansea. I learned last night for the first time on the one television program. <laughs> Sometimes on television programs you can get unpleasant surprises. This was a most pleasant one to learn a little more about my genealogy, going back as far as it could be determined to uh, the early 1600s, and also learning the most remarkable coincidence that my grandfather's family and my great-grandfather's family came to the United States at different times on the same vessel, the SS Alaska. Now, I know for sure that my grandfather's family entered the United States in New York through what was then the port of entry, known as Castle Clinton. You cannot make this up. <laughs> so to have this come to almost full circle uh, is a personal delight. It was also a point of personal pride that when I was Secretary of State, the United States officially wished the people of Wales a happy St. David's Day. And years later, when I announced my 2016 presidential campaign slogan, Stronger Together, There were more than a few who wondered if it was a secret tribute to the Welsh football team slogan, Together Stronger. Well, I can neither confirm nor deny that. But I do think those are wonderful words to play by and live by, and I feel even more strongly about that with each passing day. And that's just one more reason why I am delighted to be at this university which embodies the spirit of unity and inclusion. There is much that sets Swansea apart, like your world-renowned professors, your commitment to diversity, and a learning environment which tries to give every student the chance to thrive. 
At the heart of it is your focus on scholarship that's both intellectually rigorous and purposeful. Swansea students don't seem to be the kind of people who are content simply to sit in classrooms talking about how to make people's lives better, but are in fact eager to go out into the world and do it, as the observatory certainly exemplifies. You are scholars after my own heart. And it means the world to me that you've chosen not only to confer this honorary degree upon me, but to name this law school after me. I have enjoyed learning what the future has in store for the Hillary Rodham Clinton School of Law. And I look forward to learning more from students and faculty alike later this afternoon. And I will be coming back to visit you here at the Bay Campus, uh, both to deliver a lecture, but also to learn more about the progress that is being made. Because I feel a special connection to the work of this school. Because your central focus, the focus of the Observatory on Children's Human Rights, is my life's mission. There's nothing more important than making sure every child has the chance to live up to his or her God-given potential. That has been the through line of my career, going back to the time when I was a law student, working on early childhood development issues at the Yale Child Study Center and on child abuse, then a newly recognized phenomenon in the United States at the Yale New Haven Hospital with doctors and medical students. It all began during my first semester of law school when I saw a flyer on a campus bulletin board. Now for the current students, the idea of either a flyer or a bulletin board seems <laughs> ancient history. But indeed, that's where we got information. There was no online way to do it. So we would peruse the flyers and the notices and one said that a woman named Marion Wright Edelman, a civil rights activist, who would go on to found an organization called the Children's Defense Fund, was coming back to Yale, where she had graduated from, to give a lecture. I went, and I was captivated. Marion talked about bringing new programs in early childhood education to rural parts of America, and using her legal education to make life better for poor children and their families. After the lecture, I went up to her and asked if I could work for her that summer. She said, sure, but I can't pay you. I replied, well, I'm putting myself through law school, so I have to get paid. And she responded, well, if you can figure out how to get paid, you can have a job. So I did figure out how to get a grant, and I went to work for her, and my life changed forever. It was Marion who opened my eyes to the ways the law can protect children or come up short. I saw firsthand that children aren't just miniature adults. They need and deserve special protection under the law. But they don't always get it. And even when they do, they often need help accessing their rights. They have their own ideas and opinions, but their voices are not always heard. So after graduating from law school, I chose not to follow many of my classmates to high-powered, well-paying law firm jobs, but instead I went back to work for Marion at the Children's Defense Fund. She sent me to South Carolina to gather evidence for a lawsuit seeking to end the practice of incarcerating teenagers in jails with adults. I drove all over the state, going to courthouses, meeting with parents of 13, 14, 15-year-old boys who were stuck in jail with grown men who had committed serious felonies. It was an early exposure to the shortcomings of America's criminal justice system 
and the racial bias that still plagues the justice systems in our country and many others. For another project, I went door to door in Massachusetts to find out why so many children were not in school. One answer was that in those days, most schools could not accommodate children with disabilities. So they had no choice but to stay home. I'll never forget meeting one young girl in a wheelchair on the small back porch of her house. She told me how desperately she wanted to attend school, but her wheelchair made it impossible. My heart went out to her, but more than just my heart, I wanted to help. So I was one of those gathering data to document the scope of the problem, helping to write a report, to build a coalition, going to Washington to argue our case. It took until 1975, but the Children's Defense Fund's work, along with others, eventually helped convince Congress to pass a law requiring all public schools to make accommodations for students with disabilities. Just like in the UK, advocates and families have been working ever since to make sure children have the right and the reality to an inclusive education. Back in 1973, I wrote an article for the Harvard Educational Review titled Children Under the Law that encapsulated much of what I had seen and learned at the Children's Defense Fund. There are few other groups in our society whose well-being is so fully dependent on the actions of others. Children have to rely on their parents and families, their government, community groups, to act in their best interests. But at the time, a promising new trend was starting to emerge, and I hoped we would soon see increased recognition of the special needs and interests of children as rights under the law. At the end of the article, I wrote that children's rights cannot be secured until some particular institution has recognized them and assumed responsibility for enforcing them. Of course, we all hope the family is that institution, but families often need help. They sometimes fall short, so we have to recognize the larger responsibility. Sixteen years later, the 1989 United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child was finally arrived at and it began to formalize the rights and the needs of children internationally. For the first time in history, the rights of the world's youngest citizens were explicitly recognized by international treaty. The right to life, survival, and development. The right to protection from violence, abuse, and neglect. The right to an education, to health care and so much more. It was also the first global acknowledgement that the well-being of children is connected to the strength of their societies. That framework inspired action around the world and produced results, including the creation of the Wales Observatory on Human Rights of Children and Young People. And yes, we have made progress since then but not nearly enough. Over one billion fewer people live in extreme poverty today than they did in 1990, but children still make up nearly half of the world's poor. Even in the wealthiest countries, one in four children live in poverty. In the UK, it's closer to one in three, in the US, it's slightly higher than that. The global rate of school enrollment has stagnated over the last 10 years, and if we keep going at this rate, 
It's estimated that by 2030, 60 million children still will not have access to primary education. 16,000 children under the age of five die every day, mainly from preventable causes. If you do the mathematics, that's 11 children each minute. And the scourge of human trafficking, an issue I worked on as First Lady, as Senator and Secretary of State, still robs children around the world of their childhood. Facts such as these are, yes, heart-wrenching, but more than that, they're an outrage. And so, by the way, is the fact that the United States is the only country in the world that has not ratified the United Nations resolution on children. It just is beyond explanation. So the status of children's rights around the globe must be a wake-up call for all of us. And it isn't just about the policies of our governments. It's much deeper than that. For the last decade, the U.S. and the world have been looking to the U.K. as you set your sights on eradicating child poverty by 2020, a very ambitious goal. But it isn't just the goal that is inspiring, it's the way it has been pursued by making significant investments in early childhood education, affordable child care, policies designed to support working parents, more financial assistance for families in need. In return for making these crucial investments, the UK asked for a commitment from local communities to help close the gap between low-income children and their peers. Now, over the years, as many of you know, those investments haven't been sustained, and meeting the goal is increasingly unlikely. Like so many, I'm disappointed by that. But this initiative has produced important lessons that both here in the UK and, most importantly, the rest of the world should take note of. You have shown what is possible when we commit to tackling child poverty? What happens when the issue of child poverty is moved to the front of the line? And what happens when it is not? So I do not consider this a failed project, far from it, but as a call to continue this commitment, to find ways to use existing laws and resources to protect children in poverty and identify the gaps where we are not making the progress we should. I hope this generation of future lawyers will answer that call, which is more urgent than ever. I've said for a long time that it takes a village to raise a child, an old African proverb. But right now, the village is fractured. The bonds of community that once united us are fraying. Too much of our current discourse on both sides of the Atlantic is dominated by a zero-sum view of life, which argues that if someone else is gaining, I must be losing. The measure of any society is how we treat the most vulnerable among us, especially our children. And when we lose empathy, when it does become everyone for themselves, children are the first to suffer. Just look at my own country, where currents of anger and resentment are underpinning our national conversation. Americans are divided and less trusting of democratic institutions. But instead of bringing people together 
We have leaders who stoke our divisions, try to distract us with controversy after controversy, and undermine free speech and the press. It is nearly impossible for children's voices to rise above the cacophony. And it is no coincidence that while politicians in Washington were arguing over protests at sporting events and cavalierly alluding to nuclear war, one of the first things to fall through the cracks was children's health care. For the first time since it was passed back in 1997, Congress failed to meet the deadline to reauthorize the Children's Health Insurance Program, a vital initiative you heard referenced before that serves nine million children a year, that has helped to bring the U.S. closer than we've ever been to universal health care coverage for children. Even the tenor of our debate is affecting our children. Teachers and schools are reporting an outbreak of bullying and racially motivated insults. Here in the UK, divisive rhetoric and policy shifts are having their own effects. Right now, the residency rights of half a million children, including many who were born in the UK, are hanging in the balance. So there are reports of children being worried, feeling uncertain, even unsafe, trying to make sense of their places in the world. The Children's Commissioners for England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland have already raised concerns that children's interests are getting short shrift in the Brexit process. Now, I personally continue to believe in the value of the European Union, and more broadly, of a Europe that is whole, free, and at peace. No small accomplishment. And Britain has always been a linchpin of that vision. What's missing in both of our countries at the moment, it seems to me, and what we need more than anything else is empathy. It should not only be at the center of our individual lives, families, and communities, but at the center of our policy, politics, and public lives. In my recent book, What Happened, I write about the need for what I call radical empathy, an urgent imperative to recapture a sense of common humanity. I know that we don't always think of the law and empathy as going hand in hand, but they can and they must. I saw that up close after working for the Children's Defense Fund. I helped create a legal aid clinic in Arkansas, very similar to the Swansea Law Clinic. I went on to chair our National Legal Services Corporation board trying to expand access to lawyers, to the poor. And throughout my career as a first lady, as a senator, as secretary of state, I have seen how empathy can inspire people to reach across even the toughest divides to search for solutions. I saw that up close and very personally in Northern Ireland when I worked with the women there during the peace process. I got to know them on both sides of the sectarian divide. Women like Joyce McCartan, a Catholic mother whose 17-year-old son had been shot dead by a Protestant gunman. But Joyce refused to retreat into anger and grief. Instead, she brought together a group of Protestant and Catholic women mothers and grandmothers to a safe house where they could talk over cups of tea. On one of my trips to Belfast, Joyce invited me to join them. 
We sat around a small table at a fish and chips place, drinking tea out of an old dented aluminum teapot. And as we sipped our tea, the women told me how they had worked together for years and found, as women can, they had more in common than not. They may have attended different churches on Sunday, but they all worried when their children left for school each morning or their husbands went out for the night. The deep-rooted causes of the violence marked all of their lives. And in the end, for them and for so many other women across Northern Ireland, love of family ran deeper than calls to hatred. Those kitchen table conversations played a vital role in the peace process. And while that peace process remains a constant task, many of the women who came of age during the Troubles are the ones carrying this work forward today for the good of their own children and grandchildren. So many of the issues facing our world have a disproportionate impact on children, from poverty to gender violence to HIV AIDS to income inequality. The combination of climate change and violence have more children on the move throughout the world than ever before, making it harder for them to be schooled, to get other services, and often they end up as victims of trafficking. In conflict, children are often the most affected because they are targeted for use as child soldiers, or child brides. Even the proliferation of technology presents new threats to children in the forms of cyberbullying and exploitation. And as natural disasters and extreme weather are devastating the world, it is once again children who often suffer most. We have seen that just recently in Puerto Rico an island of American citizens where nearly 60% of the children already live below the poverty line. And when we see children taken advantage of, mistreated, or not getting the kind of opportunity, support, and encouragement they need and deserve to succeed, it should light a fire under all of us. As a presidential candidate, I had the experience time and again of meeting children whose stories, whose lives touched me. And I tried the best I could to tell those stories to wider audiences. From the terrified little girl I met in Nevada who burst into tears because although she was born in the United States, she worried her parents would be deported. To the little boy in Flint, Michigan, who got sick from drinking water poisoned with lead because of the negligence of elected and appointed officials. When I picture their faces and those of so many others, I have to ask, where is our empathy for these children? As we look to the future for both our countries, taking into account what's best for the next generation, this is not just a nice thing to do. It is both right and necessary, because when we fail children, we fail ourselves and we fail as a society. When we help to lift children out of poverty and disease and conflict and help guarantee they receive a good education and health care and support. Those investments pay off for all of us. Here at this law school and at the observatory, you are a guardian of democracy for young people. 
ensuring that their voices are heard and their rights are protected. In just a few short years, law students from this school will be working alongside students in computer science and engineering, diving into research and analysis in the new research suite. The campus is designed specifically to convene the public and private sectors, NGOs and businesses, law firms and tech companies, and integrate them into the daily life of the school. No institution that I know of in the world right now is better positioned than this law school to harness the very forces that threaten children's safety, like globalization and technology, like climate change and conflict, to search for, find, and implement new solutions. I'm pleased that the observatory already brings together schools in the United States and around the globe in a network of cooperation, and I hope more schools will join these ranks. This must be a global movement, and its hub can be right here in Swansea. As we take on the vital task of transforming the position of children within society, we can't just work on behalf of children, we have to work with children and young people. Young people must be given the opportunity to stand up, their voices to be heard, advocating for their own rights. Again, I think of people, some of whom we know, some of whom I have had the privilege of knowing, like the 10-year-old girl in Yemen, forced to marry a much older man. She made headlines, leaving that home, finding her way to the court, sitting for hours looking for someone to help her until a woman lawyer saw her, asked her what she was doing, this child in the court. She said she wanted a divorce, and the lawyer helped her receive it. Her courage helped to shine a spotlight on the continuing practice of child marriage, which has gotten so much worse because of the movement of refugees. And of course, we all know the story of Malala, the young Pakistani woman shot in the head by Taliban fighters for going to school, for speaking out against a system in which women and girls were not just second class, they were barely considered human beings. Malala became a symbol of what education can mean for girls and boys, but particularly for girls who are denied that right. And she has just started her first semester at Oxford. Here at Swansea and at the observatory, you know that children are not simply passive observers in the world. They are and must be agents of change. That was the basic underpinning of your successful campaign to create the Welsh Youth Parliament. And as one young person put it, it encourages younger generations to become more politically active, getting their voices heard instead of being drowned out in the noise. I couldn't agree more. Western democracy is facing a crisis. There are lots of anxieties about how we will continue to provide the vital elements of self-government, rule of law, protections of fundamental human rights. I think it is imperative that young people be brought into the process as early as feasible to begin to build the arguments for the maintenance and reformation of our democracies. So to all the students here today, and to those who I will have the privilege of meeting this afternoon and hopefully over years to come, please bear in mind that the cases before you, the laws you are reading, 
are not just to be left in law school. You need to imbue them with the voices that will not otherwise be heard. The millions of children who need a champion like you. Going beyond the four walls of the classroom and talking and listening and learning from children will give you the strong foundation to take the academic preparation into the real world where we need you. I hope that these principles that are underpinning the Hillary Rodham Clinton School of Law will be a beacon for those in Wales and far beyond to remember that children's rights are human rights. Thank you once again for this tremendous honor.